Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 26th of January. And this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 29th of January with me, Michael Hewson. Well, earnings season is in full swing now. We've seen a number of reasonably positive updates um, this week. Um, Netflix being a case in point, US markets have continued to eke out further record highs. European markets, um, we've seen them look to reverse the damage of the early part of last week, but it's been slow progress higher with the FTSE 100 underperforming relative to its peers. And I think what we're seeing this week is a little bit of a divergence between what we're seeing in the US in terms of the economic data and what we're seeing in Europe. And I think the main concern for investors over the course of the past few days has been trying to navigate a path through a backdrop of disappointing economic numbers in Europe and a reluctance on the part of central banks to consider the prospect of early rate cuts. Now, obviously, we've seen and we've had the European Central Bank this week, yesterday, in fact. Um, we've got some important inflation numbers in the upcoming days out of Europe. Um, we've also got some important fourth quarter GDP numbers out of Europe as well. And I think if we look at what Christine Lagarde said earlier this week, um, there was, I think, a slight change of tone um, from her while she would probably seek to deny it. She didn't actually close the door on the pos on the prospect of a rate cut in April. Um, yes, indeed, she reiterated her comments um, earlier this month to Bloomberg TV that rate cuts were not discussed. Um, it was too early for rate cuts. Um, the decision by the ECB didn't contain any surprises. Rates left on hold. The accompanying press conference was a broad word salad of jibber jabber, um, in part. Um, but I think one thing that she did say, which markets do appear to have reacted to, was, you know, while the insistence of rate cuts was premature, she didn't push back on the idea of an earlier rate cut. She could have she could have implicitly ruled out the prospect of an earlier rate cut than June, but she didn't do that. And I think that's important, particularly if you look in the context of the data that we've seen out of Germany this week, Germany and France, actually. Um, the, IFO, the IFO survey was pretty awful. In January, it pointed to a further decline in optimism about the prospects for the German economy. Companies more pessimistic about the outlook than they were at the end of last year, with the reluctance of the ECB to consider an early rate cut most likely to have soured business optimism. And, and again, consumer confidence this morning, which was released this morning, coming in at an 11 month low. Now, if we look at the reaction of the bond markets to events of the last 24 hours, look at the German two year. It's down three basis points today, but it was also down quite heavily yesterday. The, you know, bonds have gone quite big on the prospect that we might see an April rate cut. Well, you know, obviously the time to sort of signal that would be. On, in, on March 7th. And I think over the next few days, the next few weeks, could well see whether or not the prospect of a March rate cut is, is a realistic proposition. And I would argue that it is. I think that the idea that the Federal Reserve is going to cut rates before the ECB is fanciful. Um, and if we look at this week's um, US fourth quarter GDP numbers, which came in at 3.3%, um, well above, well above forecast of 2%. Um, that sort of bears out the prospect that the US economy is ticking along at a fairly decent rate. Weekly jobless claims did tick higher from 189 to 214,000, but that's still very, very low relative to where they were over a year ago. Um, and core PCE, 
quarterly core PCE is at 2%. Now, obviously, we've got the inflation numbers of core PCE, deflative inflation numbers later today. And at time of speaking, I don't have sight of those numbers. But we've got the Fed coming up um, in the next few days, the Fed rate decision. And we've also got the Bank of England rate decision. So obviously, we've heard from the ECB. We've heard from the Bank of Japan this week. Um, we might see a tightening of policy from the Bank of Japan come April. We could see a cut from the ECB come April. And then obviously we've got the Federal Reserve um, coming up at, uh, next week along with the Bank of England. So I'll start with the Fed um, because I think that's probably um, the logical place to start. But certainly I think if we look in the context of what markets have done this week, we have started to see a little bit of a rebound in the FTSE 100. If we look at it on a weekly chart, we can see the underperformance. It's quite clear. Um, we're still well below the highs that we were a year ago. Uh, we've seen a fairly decent rebound, and we look in all likelihood to um, finish this week higher. Um, and to my mind, there's no reason why we can't continue to retest the tops of this recent range. So, seen, seen some fairly solid gains this week, but still aren't particularly close to reversing the damage of last week. Unlike the DAX, which has pretty much managed to do that and a little bit more this week. And we can see that here on the weekly chart. So, looking at the current rebound. Could we see a retest of the record highs of December? Certainly seems um, a realistic possibility. 50 day moving average is looking reasonably positive, and the 200, moving, 200 day moving average is ticking higher. So at the moment, there's, I think there's no reason to suggest that we won't see um, or maintain the resilience that we've seen in markets more broadly. SP 500, again, uh, um, made consistent record highs this week. It's been incremental, more than explosive, I think. But overall, we are continuing to make higher highs and higher lows. And for me, it's really about momentum. Um, obviously, this week we saw Tesla report disappointing numbers, and that prompted a bit of a sell off in the Tesla share price. And of all the magnificent seven, I would potentially argue that Tesla's probably got the the biggest challenge when it comes to continuing to um, push up to the levels that we saw um, earlier or at the end of last year, um, at the beginning of this year, we've seen a little bit of a sideways move in Tesla. And it'll be interesting to see whether or not it's able to um, get back above $200 or risk a move back to 160. But I'm slightly, I'm slightly going off pace here. NASDAQ 100, still the trend here seems broadly positive. Moving averages, again, pointing higher, which suggests we still remain very much in buy the dips mode. And I think an awful lot of the resilience that we're seeing in US markets is, is predicated on a belief, rightly or wrongly, that the Federal Reserve is closer to cutting rates than perhaps, um, perhaps they should be. Um, the Nikkei, seen a little bit of a sell-off this week. Not really surprising when you consider the prospect that we might see a rate hike. Well, I hesitate to use the word rate hike when it comes to the Bank of Japan because you know rates are minus 0.1. So even if they pull them back into zero territory, um, they're still going to be fairly easy in terms of monetary policy. One thing I would say is that we haven't really seen a significant pullback since we broke through these peaks all the way back at the beginning of the month. So. I think we're probably well over a due a pullback when it comes to the Nikkei 225. Anyway, let's get let's get on to the Federal Reserve because we've seen a slightly stronger dollar this week, despite the fact that we've seen a softening of yields. And I think the next few days could see the Federal Reserve look to put a pin in the idea that they might look at cutting rates when they meet in March. Certainly based on what we've seen this week. There is no rush for the Federal Reserve to cut rates as early as March. Since Powell's December press conference, when he admitted that the committee had discussed rate cuts, 
only two weeks after dismissing the idea out of hand at the beginning of December, markets have decided that March is a live meeting. Now, yeah, it could well be a live meeting, but it certainly doesn't mean that they're going to be cutting rates. Um, in December, what the FOMC did was they returned the 2024 dot plots to 4.6% back to where they'd been in September. So, you know, we saw a very hawkish September meeting. They raised the 2024 dots to 5.1. In December, they returned them to back to where they were in September. I wouldn't call that particularly um, noteworthy. Um, just slightly reset the just reset the um, expectations for 2024 and gave them more flexibility when it came to easing monetary policy. So having signaled the death of higher for longer, the debate has now switched to when rate cuts are likely to begin. And I think this is key here. Um, I think for me, um, the ECB could well cut in April if the data continues to disappoint and we could get some, you know, we will certainly get some more We'll certainly get a better idea of that with the flash CPI numbers for January on the 1st of February, as well as the um, fourth quarter GDP numbers later in later in the week as well. Um, so for me, we've seen the dollar start to firm up um, as I think markets become a little bit more reluctant um, to consider um, that the ECB will be cutting after the Fed and are looking to price in an earlier rate cut. And we're certainly seeing that in euro dollar. We started to drift down. We're, we're still above 108, and we could potentially drift back to 107.30. Certainly, I don't think the euro is going to fall off a cliff, but I, I think it'll be much more difficult to head back towards 110 in the short to medium term, given what we're seeing here on this euro dollar chart. We're also seeing euro sterling um, start to drift lower as well. But again, here, I don't see any significant downside simply because um, over the course of the past 12 to 24 months, we've been trading sideways. Yes, the highs are getting lower, but we've got a pretty solid base all the way through 84, 80, 84, 90, there or thereabouts. I mean, we can zoom all the way out as far as that, but it's, it's not been particularly exciting, Euro sterling, when you look at it. And I think it's very much a range trade and will continue to be so. Dollar yen finding a little bit, of, finding a few offers above 148 and a half. But again, here 146.25, this Kumo cloud support, it's going to be a it's going to be a tough nut to crack. Um, so I think in in terms of dollar yen, we're probably 14150 on the wide at the moment. Um, certainly, I think dips are going to be um, probably bought into. And in the short to medium term, this, this is probably the extent of it as far as euro sterling is concerned. Moving to cable, and this is where things might get a little bit interesting. At the moment, what we're seeing on cable is very much a range trade, 125.90 on the downside. 50 day moving average is acting as support at the moment, but we're very much capped at 128. Now, obviously, the day after the Fed, we have the Bank of England rate decision. And when the Bank of England took the decision to hold rates steady in September, it was pretty much a close run thing. It was, it was a very close split between the Hawks and the Doves. But on the balance of risks, I think it was certainly the right thing to do, given the challenges facing the economy as, as we headed into the end of last year. Those were borne out by a very pretty awful retail sales numbers for December, minus 3.2%. Um, they've continued to look pretty disappointing, even as we look at the services PMI numbers, um, which showed a fairly decent rebound um, or continued resilience from the rebound that we saw in December. We saw 53.4 in December. We saw 53.8 in January. So while I think consumers are being very circumspect about where they spend their money, hence the big declines that we're seeing in retail sales, I think the underlying services sector is showing remarkable resilience when you look at the services sector, say, for example, in France or Germany. So I think on the balance of risks, it'll be very interesting to see whether or not the three external members of Catherine Mann, Megan Green and Jonathan Haskell, who all voted to raise rates in December by another 25 basis points, 
continue to adopt that position. I very much doubt that they will, and I think we'll get a majority, we'll get a consensus poll 9 0 um, on Thursday. Um, I think the caution is, is understandable given the high level of services inflation, which slowed to 6.1% in December, and wage growth, which slowed to 6.6% in the three months to November. Um, I think certainly, I think the fact that inflation in December ticked up to 4% and could well go up to 4.1 or 4.2% in January is likely to help keep the pound better bid against the euro, um, potentially against the yen, and also, I think, against the US dollar. Um, could well see us continue to edge higher towards 128 and potentially 130. That's not to say the Bank of England won't be cutting rates this year. They will be, but I'll be very surprised if we see a rate cut much before June. Um, certainly, I think the expectation is for um, inflation to return to target sometime in April, May. If it does, we're not going to know that for certain until May or June. So I think that for me precludes any prospect of a rate cut much before the middle of the summer. Uh, certainly, I think um, the prospect of um, elections in the UK or the US, you know, they, they, they might influence um, some of the policymakers' decisions. For me, I think that would be dangerous. I think you've got to look at the economy and try and ignore the politics. But as we all know, that's easier said than done. Um, so I think for me, the main debate now is not whether we see rate cuts this year, it's when we see rate cuts. And that equally applies to the Fed as it does to the Bank of England. So um, non-farm payrolls coming up um, next week as well. Again here, um, there were weak spots in the um, December numbers. Um, the participation rate, for example, fell from 62.8% to 62.5%. That was a bit of a head scratcher because the actual underlying numbers were fairly decent. Um, 216,000 jobs added in December. Expectations are for 185,000 jobs to be added in January. And ADP payrolls are also expected to, to see a bit of a slowdown um, after a better than expected 164 in December, we could well see 150,000. Again, that speaks to reasonable resilience when it comes to the US labor market. So again, I don't think there's any rush for um, the Fed to be looking at a March cut. Um, and, you know, we also have to bear in mind that um, there are concerns about pickup in inflation. And certainly that was that was that was reflected in the US CPI numbers. We saw a tick up in December and we could see another tick up in January when the January numbers are released. So I think I think there will there will be certainly a high degree of caution when it comes to um, trying to forward guide timing of um, uh, the timeline for rate cuts. Um, so I talked about EU flash CPI. That's also due out on the 1st of February. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not we um, see a tick down after the tick up from 2.4% to 2.9% um, in December. Core prices, they'll be interesting. They're currently at 3.4%. Will we see a further slowdown there? And German fourth quarter GDP on... Um, 30th on Tuesday, with inflation coming down sharply, I think we're going to see another contraction for the German economy at the end of Q4. And the IFO this week um, suggested that we could see another contraction in Q1, which in essence would potentially be three successive quarters of negative GDP growth um, in the first quarter. Certainly, the German economy hasn't got off to a particularly good start. Um, crude oil prices are obviously a bit of an elephant in the room. We've seen a little bit of a tick up over the course of the past few days. But a number of reasons for that. Um, talk about China's China stimulus ahead of Chinese New Year. Um, the triple R cut that basically takes effect from the 5th of February. 
Um, again, triple R cuts are all well and good, um, giving giving Chinese banks more flexibility to lend more money. That only works, of course, if there is demand from businesses and consumers to borrow money. And at the moment, there's very little evidence of that. Having said that, we are seeing a fairly decent tick up on expectations that we might see a pick up in the Chinese economy. And we are starting to see oil prices move back um, to two months highs. I think the bigger question here is whether or not we're able to take out this $84 a barrel level, which has been pretty pretty solid resistance um, since November um, and December of last year. So that's going to be a key barrier going forward. We've seen a nice little tick higher over the course of the past few days. The bigger question is whether or not we'll take out that key resistance, which is a 50%. Um, retracement of this move on this range that we've seen over the course of the past few days. So oil prices looking slightly more resilient, um, but again, still significant pockets of weakness um, when it comes to um, the economic data story going forward. Gold prices looking pretty uninteresting at the moment. We've seen a little bit of a tick lower over the course of the past few days, but I think if yields continue to drift down, we could well see um, this 2000, as long as we hold above $2,000 an ounce, we could all well start to pick back higher again. Um, but again, I think what the Fed says and does next week could well be a key determinant of what happens to oil prices, not our gold prices, over the course of the next few days. Okay, big week for earnings. We've seen Netflix this week, we've seen Tesla next week. Netflix blew the doors off, um, um, whereas Tesla was you know pretty pretty unimpressive we've got poor now of the magnificent seven in inverted commas i'm going to start with apple um it started to drift lower finding a bit of a barrier in and around this 200 dollars um area and i think for apple the key challenges will be not so much um expectations about how it um how Huawei is eating its lunch in Chinese markets because I, I think the prohibition of the Chinese government in playing a role by forbidding government employees and state owned firms from bringing their own finance to work is, I think, fueled less by security concerns and more about basically promoting a local champion. It's how Apple deals with this challenge to its market share in one of its biggest markets. I think. You know, um, Apple's exposure to the Indian market could more than offset any hit to its revenues in China. I think the bigger challenge for me is whether or not Apple, um, how how Apple sees its second quarter going forward, how it sees its projections for iPhone sales, how it sees its projections for wearables, how it sees its, how it sees its projections for its new Vision Pro. Uh, that I think that's going to determine whether or not we see a further slowdown in revenue growth, which is something that we haven't seen for quite some time when it comes to Apple's share price. Very much in an uptrend. So even in any disappointment, we could well see a little bit of a, a pullback. But the big level for me, $200 an ounce, can we break that? And will the, will the guidance that Apple gives, if any, um, point to optimism about its future growth prospects? Because Microsoft has now overtaken Apple as one of the world's biggest companies. And certainly the direction of travel here appears to be much more positive as the AI um, trade continues to push Microsoft from strength to strength. Now, earlier this week, Microsoft announced um, job cuts and it's notable that an awful lot of the tech companies are now um, starting to announce widespread job cuts. It's gone, gone, to, gone from strength to strength um one of the one of the obviously its weakest its weak spots for microsoft have been revenue in personal computing um we've also seen xbox content and services as well being a little bit of a weak spot um so investment in ai solutions is likely to be a key area for microsoft as it develops solutions for business as well as its co-pilot chatbot getting integrated into this windows operating system as it looks to replace cortana Q2 revenues are expected to come in 
at 61.1 billion dollars now that is a that is a rise of almost 20 percent commercial cloud revenue expected to account for 32.2 billion of that total so there's an awful lot of what i would call good news baked in to microsoft it'll be interesting whether or not it actually is able to um, clear that bar those the microsoft numbers are due out on the 30th of january We've also got Meta. Meta has made new all-time highs this week. It's completely reversed the drop from those August 2021 highs to those lows of November 2022. It's a 65% decline in the share price. Gone. We're now at new record highs. Um, and I think what's particularly remarkable about this rebound in the meta share price is that they rely a whole host pretty much on advertising revenue and in q3 total total revenues came in at the top end of forecast the q4 revenue guidance for meta was nudged up to between 36.5 and 40 billion dollars although at the time this was tempered by a warning that ad revenue might slow due to uncertainty around the global economy Four-year operating expenses are coming down. They were revised low between 87 and $89 billion. With a four-year revenue forecast expected to come in around about $133.7 billion and profits of $14.37 a share. So will it, you know, can Meta's share price continue to hold above the previous record highs, which it currently appears to be doing? and head towards $400 an ounce. Obviously, Reality Labs still hemorrhaging an absolute cartload of money and will probably continue to do so. At the moment, markets don't really seem to care too much about that, which does seem a little bit surprising. And um, we've also got Google, or Alphabet, sorry. Um, Google's share price revisiting record highs of 2021 back there. Interesting, I think, will be to see how YouTube has performed on the last set of numbers we saw comfortable beats with youtube seeing 7.95 billion dollars advertising 59.65 billion dollars another revenue 8.34 billion dollars for q4 revenues expected to come in at 85.3 billion dollars with cloud expected to come in at 8.95 billion dollars and profits of 159 cents a share so as we can see an awful lot of these companies have pretty much reversed all of their 2021 to 2022 losses. Can the momentum that we've seen over the course of the past few weeks continue as we get to dissect their latest quarterly numbers? So that's pretty much it for this week. As I say, there's quite a lot to get through. We've got a busy week coming up. Um, so I think it's going to be very important in the context of what we've seen so far this week. Can the momentum that we've seen in US markets be sustained in the aftermath of the release of these, the bulk of the Magnificent Seven earnings announcements. It's certainly gonna be in a very interesting week and look forward to dissecting the numbers this time next week when we have a look back at the week just gone. Thanks very much for listening. It's Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets.